today is the Founders' Day, and uh, 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 we, uh, the, the Institute uh, celebrates the birthday of Dr. Vainababu as the Founders' Day. <clears throat> and, and on this occasion, I, uh, I extend warm greetings and best wishes from Mrs. Yamuna Babu. I had a chat with her a couple of days back. And I take you to, through the uh, formation of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Um, the uh, Institute traces its origin to uh, an observatory set up during 1786 in Madras, which led to the establishment of an observatory in 1899 in Kodekanal. Uh, the three units of the Indian Meteorological Department under the Ministry of Tourism and Civilization were separated and constituted as autonomous institutes and registered as society from 1st April 1971. And this is taken at the cutout from the order. And you can see that the Astrophysical Observatory Kodekanal uh, moved to Indian Institute of Astrophysics uh, Kodekanal. So in the next slide, I take you through the uh, uh, formation uh, uh, as uh, in the words of Professor Keshiv Raman, who was present at that time, the observatory, after functioning for almost 75 years in Korea Kanal under the administrative control of the India Meteorological Department, became an autonomous institution in April 1, 1971, under the continuing leadership of Dr. Vainabapu. The message of becoming autonomous was made known to the then staff a few months before, and the substantial part of the staff, both technical and administrative, chose to opt out of the Meteorological Department. Dr. Bapu, in his brief emotional address, spoke about his plan for expansion to the staff of IAA. His vision was to make the Institute a center of excellence in observational and theoretical astrophysics. Now, I uh, take you through the growth of the Institute through the short messages I've received from the previous directors of the Institute. Uh, this is a message from Professor Ramnath Kaushik. The Indian Institute of Astrophysics is one of the oldest uh, academic institutions and dates back its origins to 1786. Uh, it made many pioneering discoveries, including the discovery of the element helium. In um, 1971, Dr. Bapu, the eminent astronomer and the director of the observatory, was instrumental in making it an autonomous body under the government of India. He named it the Indian Institute of Astrophysics to reflect its broader mission of research and education. Since the time of Bapu, several directors have rendered dedicated service to the Institute. Uh, and the Department of Science and Technology has contributed to provide generous support. The Founders' Day is of remembrances and for looking ahead to take the Institute from Crescendo to Crescendo. And it, the, the Institute celebrate the, uh, celebrated IH25 in 1996 when Pro, Professor Kaushik was the director. Next message from Professor Suraj Hassan. In this incredible growth trajectory over the past 50 years, several uh, uh, major programs have been realized. The 2.3 meter Vainabapu telescope, the 2 meter Han Hanle Chandra telescope, and the ultraviolet imaging telescope in space on AstroSat are some fine examples of the truly novel initiatives in this direction. Several new projects are underway, such as the space coronagraph on Aditya, Indian participation in the international uh, 30 meter telescope project, and the proposed national large solar telescope. I'm confident that the Institute will continue to grow from strength to strength and to inspire the next generation through its multifaceted activities. In the message from uh, uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Sri Kumar, the past 50 years have been very productive with large focus on the national capacity building. With campuses spread across the nation, this institute has a rich history of building up facilities from the ground base to space base, all the way from the empty site to a functioning world-class telescope and providing access to national and international users. The vibrant student participation in the full spectrum of research, including astronomical instrumentation, makes IA very special. This also places demand on IA to be the key, a conscious keeper for broad spectrum astronomy research in India. In the next 50 years, IA can be and must be the main driver for Indian astronomy to reach the glorious heights we often dream of. I congratulate the IA family for their achievements, the tenacity with which they work collectively to accomplish goals, and the openness with which they embrace the wider community. As one who is fortunate to have been associated with the IA family, my greetings and best wishes on this Golden Jubilee celebration. Now, I have been associated with the Institute for uh, almost three decades, and the, the baton is now passed on to me to carry on with the task of taking the Institute to the next decade and greater heights. 
I shall do my best to make this institute fulfill its dreams and initiatives with the generous support from the Department of Science and Technology and the Government of India. On this Founders' Day, let's all pledge to continue our scientific journey with more vigor, focus, and productivity. Thank you. And uh, um, I'm very happy and thankful to both uh, uh, Professor uh, Ashutosh Sharma and Professor Vijay Raghavan to be present on this day, along with uh, our Governing Council Chair, uh, Professor uh, um, Avinash Pandey. Now I request uh, Professor Sharma to inaugurate the IA50 celebration with the release of the logo. Okay. Um, so it is indeed delightful that we are meeting up on the Founders uh, Day, which is uh, now the 50th uh, year of the Institute, which also happened to coincide with the 50th year uh, of DST. Uh, so it's great to grow up together, uh, contribute to each other's progress, um, and on this day, uh, this is so apt that we have Dr. K. Vijay Raghavan with us, uh, speaking about uh, deep and fascinating signs uh, of uh, movement and mo uh, mobility, ability to move, and how did it develop. Uh, so this is great. And we have Professor Vinash Pandey, uh, Chairman of the Council, Governing Council with us, uh, and the Director uh, Subramaniam, uh, all the faculty, staff, and students who have joined us today. Indeed, a great occasion because 50th year, uh, to my mind, is rather special in the journey of an institution, a scientific institution, uh, because uh, the, the early uh, vision provided by Dr. Venu Bapu, uh, you see, everything begins with a great vision and the energy of a group of people, uh, which were led very ably in this case by uh, Dr. Bapu. Uh, we, of course, in, in the new phase, of reconstructing our science uh, and Atmanirbhar Bharat, we certainly need more leadership of that kind. Uh, and 50th year basically is that foundation. Uh, so the early, uh, you know, energy uh, and enthusiasm of the institution uh, is now also develops with the experience and information and wisdom that one gains over five decades. Uh, so there is a, you know, one achieves a very good balance. Uh, between the energy and experience. And uh, the way to go forward to build on this foundation of 50 years uh, would be indeed uh, to maintain that energy and that happens by infusion of younger people, uh, the best of people and the new ideas. So without diluting the energy uh, as we gain more experience and more wisdom, uh, indeed that, that's the way to go forward for the next 50 years. Uh, so indeed, uh, that's happening. Uh, IIA has done extremely well uh, in producing human resources of quality, in producing infrastructure, uh, in providing observational astronomy, in providing deep science. Uh, so I haven't any doubt uh, that this uh, would continue to happen, continue to flourish, and scale greater heights all the time. Um, it's very easy uh, to, to slide. Uh, and so, but, um, uh, you know, with the right kind of resources uh, and vision and roadmap, it, it is always um, not only possible, but would happen in this case. I am very certain that this would continue to scale new heights. I wish everybody all the best uh, going forward for the next 50 years uh, for which we lay the foundation stone today. Let this be beginning of another beautiful journey that we would indeed all be very proud of, uh, that we will all contribute to um, every one of us who is a stakeholder, the family of this institute. Thank you very much. Let's go ahead with the logo launch. So I just wanted to add that this logo uh, was uh, uh, come as the winner among the about 40 odd logos, which was which were the, uh, presented. And then we have uh, uh, this ba chosen based on a, um, a winning vote. And uh, this logo is made by Dr. Crispin Karthik of the Institute. So thank you so much, sir, for your kind words and release of the logo. Thank you. So now uh, we move on to the next uh, event, which is the release of the IAE magazine booth. I uh, request uh, our governing council chair, Professor Avinash Chandra Pandey, to uh, release this uh, magazine, which is put together by the students of the Institute. 
Honorable Professor Vijay Raghunji, Professor Sharma ji, Professor Annapurni, esteemed colleagues, distinguished scientists, and my dear students, it is really a matter of pleasure to release this uh, e-magazine. Albert Einstein said that uh, the true science of intelligence is not knowledge but imagination. So through this magazine, we are providing platform to our students to creatively engage themselves. And you can see the first cover page, which is a manifestation of how we can creatively portray the, some of the uh, unique things and also make it easy to understand for the masses. So this will be a, a good beginning to reach to the society and also to the masses through this e-initiative. I also congratulate you all on the Foundation Day of IIA. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, uh, Pandeji, for releasing this magazine. This will be made available, this e magazine, so it will be available from our website for download and read. Uh, thank you so much. So, we move on to the next uh, uh, part of the program, Professor uh, Gajendra Pandey. Yeah. Anupama, are you ready? Okay. Now, I request Professor Anupama, Dean of the Institute, to introduce Professor Vijay Raghavan, who will today deliver the Founders Day lecture. Anupama, please. Yeah, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan here with us today to deliver the Founders Day lecture for uh, this year. Uh, Krishna Swami Vijay Raghavan was born on 3rd February, 1954. He did his uh, B.Tech in Chemical Engineering and M.Tech from IIT Kanpur. And he did his PhD in Molecular Biology from Bombay University while he was working at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. Thereafter, he was a research fellow and a senior research fellow at Caltech in the US. Professor Vijay Raghavan is a geneticist and a developmental biologist. He has developed our understanding of muscle development through studies performed in the fruit fly, that is Drosophila. He identified the mechanisms that control the nervous system and muscles during development and investigated how they control movement. He examined how a set of control genes called the Hox genes oversee the specialization of muscles and nerves during the development of an embryo. In particular, Vijayaraghavan's work has contributed to the knowledge of molecular and cellular steps in the growth of flight muscle. He has investigated how neural networks are constructed during development and how this leads to the muscle's ability to produce coordinated movement. Professor Vijayaraghavan's contributions have brought international recognition, and he is currently serving as a principal scientific advisor to the government of India. Professor Vijayaraghavan has served as the Secretary Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, and he also held additional charge as Secretary Department of Science and Technology for a brief period. In fact, it was during this period that um, you know we signed the partnership deed for India's participation in the 30 meter telescope. We are grateful for that. Now, prior to uh, these designations, he was the director of the National Center for uh, Biological Sciences, NCBS in Bangalore, and also the interim head of the Institute of Stem Cell Biology and Regenerative Medicine in STEM, an autonomous institution under the Department of Biotechnology. Professor Vijay Raghavan has received numerous honors and awards. He has been conferred with the honorary director, uh, Doctor of Science degree by the University of Edinburgh in 2011. He is a J.C. Bose Fellow of the Department of Science and Technology. He gave the J.C. Bose Memorial Lecture at the Royal Society in 2010. He has been awarded the inaugural Infosys Prize in Life Sciences in 2009. Uh, he's a recipient of the Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Award in 1998. And uh, he's also recognized as one of the top 50 alumni by IIT Kanpur during its Silver Jubilee, uh, Golden Jubilee year. He is a fellow of the Indian National Science Academy and the Indian Academy of Sciences, and in fact has served in the council of the latter. He is the only Indian to be elected as an associate member of the European Molecular Biology Organization. And he has been uh, you know, um, 
conferred with the Distinguished Padma Award. He was awarded the Padma Shri in 2013 by the Government of India. He was elected as Foreign Associate in the US National Academy of Sciences in 2014. It's a great pleasure to have you, sir, deliver this year's uh, Founders Day lecture. I now request you to um, deliver the Institute's Founders Day lecture on the title, The Development of the Ability to. Over to you, sir. Um, thank you very, very much, Anupama, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. Um, I should say that uh, after that, I should perhaps not give my lecture and just ask if there are any questions. Um, uh, by the way, there are a couple of uh, uh, errors in that because of time. And if you let me know offline later on where you got some of that information, I can get it corrected. Uh, but thank you very much again. And uh, thank you uh, to the uh, director, the chair of the governing body, Dr. Avinash Pandey, uh, Secretary DST Ashutosh Sharma, and all of you for being here today. Uh, it's always a big challenge to give a talk to uh, an extraordinary audience such as this uh, in person, and it's even greater challenge to give it online, and it's yet greater challenge to give it when the audience is also online. So, you know, there is uh, um, we have little idea of whether I'm communicating or not, so I can't see whether you're sleeping or not. And um, so uh, let's see how it goes. Well, but again, thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. I've, uh, you know, when I was at the uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Researchers Mumbai campus uh, for many years, uh, we used to have the astronomy group and the radio astronomy group both on the same floor as the molecular biology unit. So I grew up very close to uh, astronomers uh, and astrophysicists. Um, also, the entrance exam for the PhD at uh, TIFR involved interviews in which not just biologists, but mathematicians and physicists and astronomers were there, which is just as well because I knew no biology at that time when I appeared for the interview. And I chanced um, so in the interview committee where um, some people whom you might know, uh, Professor Chitre, uh, Professor Devakaran, and uh, I went into that interview without any idea of what I was going to be asked. Fortunately, just before that, I was uh, sitting in the TIFR library and chanced upon a new volume which had arrived there that was uh, Mr. Thorn and Wheeler's book on gravitation. And I was you know, leafing through that I was very fascinated because of my chemical engineering background. Um, and then when I went in, Chitre asked me questions on the Navier-Stokes equation and how it can be applied to a variety of different contexts. It is completely um, you know, not biology at all, of course, but also something which I had no, I completely forgotten about uh, many of the aspects he asked about, except that I just happened to refresh myself uh, half an hour earlier. So uh, luck plays a very uh, interesting role in what happens. Uh, what I'll do today, without uh, any further ado, is try to address the topic on how uh, movement begins um, or locomotion begins. And locomotion is, is pretty much the output, or movement is pretty much the output of the nervous system. Because no matter what information we sense from our surroundings, how we take it up, we process it in our brains or wherever, in our spinal cords or wherever, then there is output. And that output, whether it's moving our eyes or speech or going from one place to another, is the, is the substantive output end of the nervous system. Uh, of course, there's a lot which goes on inside, which is abstraction and, you know, what is consciousness and so on, and we leave that aside for the moment. Now, people have studied movement a lot in multiple ways. How do animals actually move? And there's a lot of understanding about the function of movement, both at the end of the output, that is muscles and how they move the animal from one location to another, how legs and wings move, 
Um, and there's also been a substantial amount of work on how the connectivity of the commands which control movement, motor nerves, which tell the animal how to move, how that is done. There is another field of interest which started growing about 20 years ago and has really become very, and that is about how movement develops. How is the assembly of the nervous system put in place? How is it that a baby, you know, monkey, for example, can run around so much, so rapidly soon after it's born, and we don't? How is it that a mountain goat, right after it's born, can climb the steepest of slopes? How does this ability to move and deal with the real world, how is that put together before the animal experiences the real world? Now, the answer to that question lies in many parts, but substantially, it lies in breaking down the components required for movement into different units, the nervous system, the muscles, the tendons, connection to the brain, and so on, and asking how each of those develop. And just as in an automobile factory, you have different parts manufactured, both to function perfectly, but also connect to other parts so that the interaction functions perfectly. You don't have to test each automobile out, but you know you make the parts so well and you put them together so that when the automobile rolls out, it just functions beautifully. And that's why a fruit fly, for example, uh, which is the organism which my laboratory works on, is able to fly as soon as it emerges from the pupil case, and it doesn't have to go to flight training school. So the question, the complex question of walking and flying can be broken down into how the parts are made and put together during that. Now, it's all very well to say this, but how does one get an understanding of what, this, what happens? And just as in astronomy, the tools for observation at, of all these parts at the finest level, from the electron microscopic to the level of the organism, have become better and better over the, over the last 20 or 30 years. So we can, we can open up the animal during its development and ask what is happening and observe what is happening. It's not just observing what is happening, but you can use dyes of various kinds, labels of various kinds, to highlight different components and observe them, just as you have observational astronomy across various spectra. But there's one extraordinary feature different from astronomy in observational biology of this sort. Observation is important, and as Feynman said, biology is all about seeing what is happening. But you can see what is happening at a very different way in biology today. Not only can you use quality microscopy and extraordinary labels of various kinds to see cells at their finest resolution, but you can also do two fundamentally important things. You can knock down the function of specific components of cells or of cells themselves, or you can increase the function of cells and their components. You can also remove cells from a, one location and genetically put them also in other locations. So these loss of function and gain of function technologies allow, along with observational tools of the kind which are so good at in astronomy, to, to actually experiment. But just as astronomy benefits from all of physics and its theories and its experiment on Earth, Biology, of course, benefits from that. But unlike astronomy, there is very little all-encompassing theory which links the molecular and cellular to the behavior of the entire organism. We have two principal theories which are there. One is the theory of evolution by natural selection, which has been proven to be correct by a variety of means, and the understanding of how all chemistry on this planet is linked by the thread of DNA. So understanding one organism helps you understand another organism because they're all linked through this chemistry by evolution. But other than these two fundamental points, and everything else is derivative of this, 
we don't have an all-encompassing theory of biology as you search for in physics. And therefore, it is important to study every organism well. But because of this thread of DNA connecting all life on Earth, our studies from one organism are of great value in another organism. Therefore, for example, we have learned enormously about cancer from studying the fruit fly. Today, a huge fundamental uh, leap in our understanding of innate immunity, which is important in dealing with the COVID pandemic, has come from studies in the fruit fly for which a Nobel Prize was awarded. So the reason for this is the same toolkit which is used to make a fruit fly is used to make a human. Just as the same toolkit- Excuse me, sir. In terms of Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Please. Sir, if we are not able to view your slides. You are still on your first slide? Yes, is that, you're seeing my first slide, right? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, sorry about it. We thought we, no, okay, no, no, please no, go ahead, sir. Okay, perfect. Thank you, sir. I, I, Thank you. I, I'll, start, I'll start moving it soon. Okay, let me move it now. So, you see on the left, the fruit fly, which is the topic of my discussion today. And to make this extraordinary organism, you use a toolkit, which is essentially identical to the toolkit to make a small worm or a human being. So in other words, just as you would use the same fundamental principles to make a small optical telescope or a huge optical telescope, but you would do the implementation program in multiple ways, just as you would use the same principles to make a small aircraft as opposed to a large one, but you use, use different kinds of materials and different kinds of implementation programs, the rules to make a human and a fruit fly are identical. And those rules are simple. You get information, cells get information from their parent cells, that's one principle. Cells interact with neighboring cells, that's the second principle. And thirdly, cells interact with cells far away from them through long range signaling. These three principles, and the fourth one is the ability of cells to move from one location to another, are used again and again in biology and used in a manner, in a combinatorial manner, to construct complex structures. So, coming back now to movement, what you do then is you break the components into the nervous system, into muscles, into um, you know, attachment sites, and then make these components according to these rules, and then you come to them. So it's as simple as that. Now here is a fly on the left-hand side. It's about a millimeter long. I should have put the scale bar. Uh, I was making these slides in a hurry this morning, and I omitted to put the scale bar. But the thorax, the middle part, which is shown in the schematic on the right, is a very large part of the fly, and inside the thorax are huge muscles, which I'll be talking about. But before I come to that, here is a person, and there are many such, who get information from what they see, what they know about the game, what they know about the, uh, the team, other team members, the uh, opposition, and they plan and move and kick the ball with great speed. Now, this is absolutely extraordinary what is happening here, and this ability to respond at such high speed is what is amazing, and the question is, how does this develop? So it's not that only humans play football. Uh, flies also play football, as you can see this fly, uh, you know, rolling a styrofoam ball quite well. Um, and so this is something which, uh, you know, the ability to walk in complex ways is something which flies go. Of course, this is a joke slide, but, you know, flies can do extraordinarily complex movements, respond to visual stimuli, evade predators, uh, some flies can catch prey, and so on and so forth. Okay. And this can be tracked exquisitely in this manner in slow motion, where the movement of every single leg can be tracked. And since we know, and this is important, since we know the movement of uh, every single leg, and we also know the, uh, sorry, and, and we also know the position of every single muscle. We know the 
connection of motor neurons which stimulate these legs and we know the central locations of these motor neurons where they receive their controls. So just by looking at the outside, we can see which muscles are moving, which neurons are activated, and which neurons signal to these neurons. So that's inside this box of movement, there's a lot of work which has gone on which tells us what exactly is happening. So that connection of the inside to the outside, the connection of minor molecular twitches to big scale movement is one of the extraordinary features of biology where you know, molecular scale events can also manifest them in very small uh, time scales to large uh, movements of the sort. Now, it's not just walking, which is illustrated here. Uh, flies also integrate, like that footballer Ronaldo, uh, multimodal inputs. And I don't know whether you can see this here, but in this, there's a fruit fly which is flying, and it's about to land on a banana. It can smell the banana. It can see now as it comes closer what's there. It can see whether someone is trying to swat it or not. And it actually starts moving towards the banana. And this shows, you know, one squished banana here. And there's nearby a, another uh, column with, uh, which doesn't have a banana, but something which looks like a banana. So after all this careful planning and so on, the fly lands on this. A specific uh, a food item. So how does it, its brain and other inputs sense the environmental lands? And that's a, another very important point. Now, as I said, the way this happens is because of its nervous system. And at the top left are shown all the muscles in the thorax which are involved in flight. And the green branches are the nervous system going there. So you can count from the top six big fibers in this particular muscle set. And there are also other um, aspects of muscle development which are important, which put all this together. So one is the muscle themselves, the other is the nervous system, and below the top left-hand side panel, the bottom left-hand side in big red are the attachment sites. So the muscles have to attach themselves. And the left-hand side column is the flight muscle set, and below are the right hand side below shows the muscle of the leg. So this is just to illustrate that we know in great detail when we see the outside, flight or walking, what the inside looks like and what the action is. The action inside can be summarized schematically, very simply, by this figure. What are shown and called as dendrites, these collect signals from smell, from visual and taste stimuli, integrate that those are integrated in the brain, and an output comes to the motor nerve, which will activate through movement signals on its axons and activate the muscles which are shown in red. So today I will summarize briefly how the nervous system is put together and how the muscles are put together. Now the nervous system, this part here, the dendrites are important because they receive signals from the rest of the brain and uh, rest of the nervous system. So the positioning of these arbors here, which are you know, thousands of arbors in a single neuron, uh, is very, very important because they connect to thousands of other inputs. And that positioning is something which can be studied very carefully. And this shows a microscopic image of how the arbors are positioned in one way in one case on the left and another way in another case for identified single neurons. Now there are thousands of neurons in this part uh, of the nervous system of the fly. But again, through genetic tools, one can look at individual neurons and how they work. So these methods then tell us what are the rules which govern these arborizations, how these neurons are born, and how they connect to specific muscles. And I won't go into all of that detail, but that work has been done in the lab over many, many years. Uh, most recently by a very talented graduate student uh, who is now a postdoc at Santa Barbara, uh, Sakina. So Sakina studied how these rules uh, are made and how they function. Now, let's go to the second part, which is how the muscles themselves shown in red are made. Now, here there's something important to keep in mind. 
These muscles, the muscles in the thorax, which are the huge flight muscles, for example, or the muscles in our legs, they are extraordinarily large muscles. And they derive their power in a very unusual manner. Normally, each biological cell is a separate cell, but uh, with one nucleus where its genetic material is there. But in muscles, what happens is hundreds and thousands of these cells fuse together to form one large fiber in which the DNA, the nucleus, which is present in the nucleus, is inside this large fiber as multiple nuclei. So these are called multinucleate cells or a syncytium of many, many cells put together. So the development of the muscle has got multiple components. How do you make such a large number of cells? How do you fuse them? And how do you organize them? Now, how do you make such a large number of cells to make this fiber? And that was not known really well till recently. And work from our laboratory showed, and that's on the left-hand side, that there are two phases. One, cells divide in a linear manner. So each cell gives rise to two daughter cells, right? And then, um, uh, sorry, exponential manner, each cell gives rise to two daughter cells, then again two and four and eight and so on. And this happens as it's shown in the left-hand side early from cells which are muscle precursors. Later on what happens, these cells change so that they expand in a linear manner and move from an exponential amplification to a linear amplification with each cell behaving like what is called a stem cell. And the stem cell now gives rise to a daughter stem cell and another muscle cell. So then again, the stem cell divides once more to give rise to another stem cell and a daughter muscle cell. So the muscle cells are expanding linearly over here, but you've created another structure, another type of cell called the stem cell. And these stem cells are very important, as I'll tell you a little so by a combination of exponential initial amplification and a linear later amplification, you generate a very large number of cells which can fuse and form a muscle. But importantly, you also generate stem cells which stay on and don't fuse to form the muscle. This work was done by Rajesh Gunage, uh, was started by him, and he's done an extraordinary job in identifying this mechanism of cell proliferation. Now, I told you about these cells which will now fuse and make this big muscle. What happens to these stem cells which don't fuse? That is something which is very interesting. These stem cells shown in green in the middle um, of these uh, magenta fibers, they stay outside the fiber. And when the muscle is damaged, they amplify, proliferate, and on the right-hand side columns, they fuse with the muscle fiber and repair the muscle. So muscle repair takes place, and this was known for some time that there are satellite cells, as they were called, which fuse and repair to muscle. But the work from Rajesh and Dhananjay Chaturvedi in the lab and others have shown that these satellite cells originate during muscle cell proliferation. They stay outside and they fuse in this manner, and the molecular mechanisms of that also, they're elucidated in the flies flight muscle system. And this is Dhananjay Chaturvedi, who, along with Rajesh uh, Gunage, studied how the muscle stem cells repair muscles. Now, once the cells amplify and they fuse, they need to form these very tightly organized muscle fibers. And these fibers all they contract in synchrony. The fly's flight muscle system, for example, contracts and relaxes about 200 times a second. And for that to happen really well and power its incredible flight, an example which you saw, the muscles have to be organized perfectly. And that organization is shown electron microscopically in the right-hand side top panel. And from the left and the middle, you see how that organization takes place by a very beautiful electron microscopic study, which Nagaraju did. So to summarize now, what we have is, and this is uh, Nagaraju. 
summarize now, we have an understanding of how the nervous system is put together, how the muscles are put together, and how movement comes about as a consequence of that. Just as stem cells proliferate asymmetrically to make the muscle, stem cells also proliferate to make the entire nervous system. Not just the motor nerves, but, but parts, other parts of our spinal cord and other parts of our brain. I use R because what we learn from fruit flies is something which is applicable by and large to many other systems. Details vary hugely, of course. In other words, when you look at something as complex as this movement, you have multiple components coming together at the heart of their development are stem cells, which are assigned different fates early during development. They and their progeny keep these kinds of cell fates. Are you going to become a bundle of nerve cells, which are in the central brain performing this kind of function, or in the spinal cord performing some other kind of function? Um, they connect to sensory neurons, which get inputs from outside. And similar, similar kinds of stem cells proliferate to make our muscles, our gut, our you know, other parts of our body, our blood system, and so on. All of these use the same high-level toolkit applied in different ways in different contexts to make these. These toolkits pretty much are similar to, analogous to screwdrivers, nuts, bolts, and so on. What kinds of materials you use, what kinds of um, how many times you use some uh, components of the toolkit, where you use it, are all components which are there uh, and there are structured rules during development which tell you what to do. You, you put all this together, all these different parts together at different times uh, during development in different places, connect them together as the animal is ready to emerge. And, you know, amazingly, this kind of incredible function comes about. So I'd like to stop here. Uh, thank you very, very much for uh, listening to me. I've tried to keep it really brief so that there's time for questions. And I've left out a lot of work by a lot of wonderful people in the laboratory and uh, pointed out to only the work of very few people. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Um, there is a question, and I'll just read it out. This is by Ankit Kumar. Uh, he would like to know how we know whether the fly is rolling the ball or is it walking on the surface of the ball, which is actually making the ball to roll? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, the fly is not, the fly is stuck on its back and therefore it's trying to escape and trying to walk. Because it's a very light ball, it's able to hold it up and the ball rolls. It's not planning to roll the ball at all. You can do the movement the other way around. You can have a fly upright and the ball held up so that you know, uh, there's an there's a airflow or uh, the ball is resting on a surface where it can smoothly move like a ball bearing in a hole. And then you can um, see the fly walking, if the fly is tethered. Now you can do something even more wonderful. You can, while the fly is doing this, you can open up the fly and by calcium imaging of function in the nervous system, you can see which neurons are firing and what's happening, which neurons in the brain are responding to smell stimuli when it moves one way or the other. And because the fly is sitting on a vertical, vertically on a ball, it can move multiple ways. If it's free to do that, then you can have complex optomotor stimuli and see how it moves around. You can have the fly flying and see how it moves around. So really amazing things have been happening over the last literally five years or so about understanding of optomotor responses, multimodal stimuli, how they respond, and how which parts of the nervous system function. So it's moved to just from observational uh, biology to also knowing what's happening inside the animal. Uh, Anfuma, can I ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, so uh, I, I see the flies move very fast. I mean, it's very hard to see them. So how do, when you do the research, how do you actually uh, uh, make, I mean, uh, map its motions? I mean, you would need some special cameras or some equipments to do this. 
How does one go about doing yeah, yeah, yeah. it? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So there are two ways of doing it. Uh, both require you know um, high speed cameras. One is you tether the animal so that it's in a specific location and it's hanging from um, uh, uh, a glued on small stick so that when it flies, you know, you can actually point the camera exactly at one location. And that's one way to do that. Or when it walks, you can do that. If you remove its wings and allow it to walk on a surface, then you can follow it with a camera. We do that. Uh, we make it walk on um, a slide with soot, for example, so you can see its footprints. So those are those kinds of tricks. But Sanjay Sane in the, at the National Center for Biological Sciences, uh, whose uh, movie, whose lab's movie I showed, he's got uh, both extraordinary um, high resolution wind tunnels and high resolution cameras where he can see free flight uh, taking place uh, by high speed recording. Um, so every little movement can be looked at. So that's absolutely terrific. And is there any application to any other uh, areas like uh, defense or because where you would like to see some something in special or something like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. all all defense agencies get very excited when they see high resolution pictures of uh, large and small insects flying. So it's a very good way of getting grants from different defense agencies. Um, but um, other than that, there's been very good uh, dramatic changes in technology the last few years to actually design uh, really small insect size or slightly larger size drones of various kinds. Uh, we still don't know the um, bottom-up basis of flight in insects. Uh, so the way insects fly, uh, fly and maneuver is not something one can easily mimic or get even close to mimicking, but there are really good uh, drones now which can do a lot. Yeah, that, there's a question by uh, Vaishali Nigam, who wants to know why fruit fly is um, chosen and not some other organism for the study of the nervous system. Oh, um, there are many organisms which have been chosen for the study of the nervous system. The fruit fly is very interesting because its um, original studies came about by looking at outside characteristics such as eye colors, wing color, wing shape, and so on and so forth as a tool for studying genetics. And so, you know, those were the, this was one of the first organisms uh, amongst many bacteria, fungi, fruit flies, well, those used to understand genetics. It turned out as time went on, that it is also a very good organism to study development because you can make mutations and look at the consequences on development and on behavior, such as effects on memory, learning, and so on. But very excitingly, it's got a very small genes, genome size, and therefore, you know, it is handleable right from genetics to behavior and everything inside. Then it turned out that extraordinary developments in microscopy, in genetics and molecular biology allows you to map every single neuron and where its connect, uh, connection is, not yet entirely as in another organism, the worm, as it's called, Cynorhabditis elegans, so the worm and the fruit fly have been the powerhouses of understanding the nervous system. The mouse is another organism, the zebra fish is another, and these really have told us a lot, along with a lot of very beautiful studies in the wild, ecology and uh, you know, ecosystem biology and evolutionary biology has told us a lot about how the nervous system and behavior are related. So all of these come together in an interesting way. Uh, there have been very recent studies which have been very uh, valuable in understanding how human nervous systems are made and developed because you can culture organoids or stem cells uh, in the laboratory and see how human cells also connect and develop in ways which were not easy to do earlier. Yeah, so um, this brings to the question by uh, Baswaraj Kagali. Uh, who wants to know what is the effect of aging on the nervous system? 
Um, that's very valuable. That's something, uh, coincidentally, uh, we study not directly in the lab, and many other laboratories have studied that. With aging, multiple things happen to multiple tissues. Um, first of all, it's uh, the entire profile of gene expression changes. And there are views that aging is a reversible process. It's a naturally uh, you know, happening developmental process. And if you could move that profile of gene expression to what you see in aging to an earlier one, then you, know, you could reverse aging as it were. Now, there are two components to aging, one which happens inside a tissue because of changes intrinsic to that tissue, and others, changes which happen in the tissue because of changes outside. Let's say, you know, components in your blood which affect that particular tissue. So this is an area of intense work, not only in the nervous system, but every other part. And as human populations live longer and longer, uh, the quality of life becomes very important and aging related illnesses become very important. And the fruit fly has become a very important model to study this. Um, there are lots of studies on this. I'm afraid that right now it's sort of like the early days of astronomy. There's lots of correlative work, observational work, lots of leaps of, from correlation to causation. Uh, but we, and some people are looking for a magic solution. Others think it's complex, but this is an area where a lot of really very good work has happened. There's also been very good work which has happened on regenerating damaged nervous systems, which are not thought to be easy, but that is increasingly becoming very valuable. So while aging is an important component, uh, the regeneration of damaged spinal cords, which is very common, or the repair of damaged spinal cords, is something which we might have a better handle on before we have a handle on uh, the aging brain, for example. Yeah, um, Sujan has a question. Sujan Sen Gupta, he wants to know if a gene by chance makes a mistake, is there a higher authority that can correct the gene? And also, um, how is um, a mistake by the gene self-corrected? So, um, thank you. This is a very interesting question. Um, what do genes do? Genes typically, they do lots of other things, but they typically encode gene products such as proteins through an intermediate called an RNA. So DNA makes, RNA makes protein is a good first approximation to uh, tell you what a gene does. Now the gene needs to do two things. It needs to express the right protein, make the right protein, and it has to do the right protein at the right level and at the right so there's a control region which tells you how much to make and where to make. And there's a structural region, as it were, which tells you what to make. And there can be errors in all these, how, how much to make, where to make, and what to make. Genes, when, they, when cells replicate, there are error correcting mechanisms which correct mistakes in replication. And when genes make RNA and RNA makes protein, there are proofreading mechanisms which ensure that the RNA is correct. If, if it were not for this, there would be a huge number of errors. But it's because of the prevalence of errors in these processes, both internal and externally induced, that we are there on this planet. All life originated from, as the first approximation, single cellular organisms billions of years ago. And Multiple forms of life have come about because of changes, errors as it were, in genes which resulted in variant organisms and errors in gene uh, duplication which resulted in variation within an organism. So that happens over hundreds of millions of years or, or millions of years or tens of thousands of years. So errors take place at a low frequency there are internal error correction mechanisms, but the leak through of some errors is what makes for diversity of life. Uh, Rishabh Teja would like to know if there's any effect on the functioning of nervous system under an external stimulus. And if so, well, 
uh, how would it affect the results obtained when a fly is tied as to when it is flying freely? So there are very beautiful methods now which look at all what I said in freely flying animals. And you know some substantive results hold, others don't. So yes, there's enormous difference. Um, of course, the nervous system changes because of external inputs. Our ability to remember is a consequence of you know, um, our nervous system changing because of external inputs. There is a constant humming noise of something drilling, uh, let's say outside. After some time, you learn to ignore that. That's your nervous system getting habituated to something. And the mechanisms by which such habituation takes place is something which you know, many labs all over the world in our lab, along with Dr. Mani Ramaswamy is in Ireland study. Um, so, you know, the nervous system does change uh, with external input. It gets used to it, it learns, and different contexts result in different internal states and outputs. Yeah, we have um, Ishwaredi who wants to know if there's a correlation between the development of ability to move with the lifespan of an organism. Ah, you know, just um, some uh, weeks ago, I was looking at a photograph, a beautiful photograph of a fly, uh, which goes through its stages of uh, you know, early development. It's a caterpillar, eats a lot, takes some days to eat and become a beautiful fly. And that fly lives for about three or four minutes. Uh, it has to find a mate, mate, lay eggs, and then die. So, you know, there's every single kind of possibility in nature, depending on what that niche is which selected it. And I don't know that the ability to move or not uh, correlates with lifespan. Um, there are, you know, animals which live um, a very, very long time. Uh, animals which can be frozen and can stay a long time, animals which hibernate, animals which move uh, rapidly and die soon. So I don't know the answer, but I think typically the energy requirement for rapid movement is huge. And expending that energy constantly results in a metabolic rate which can cause other kinds of problems. And therefore those animals typically you know, are susceptible to other kinds of illnesses unless they have backup abilities uh, to prevent that from happening. There are lots of interesting things over there, but I'll leave that discussion for another time. Yeah, so um, I think we'll have just one last question, and this is by Rajgur uh, on a topic. That I, I also have one question, Ashutosh here, anytime. Yeah, please, sir, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you, you go ahead first with the other question. Okay, okay. So Rajguru wanted to know if we can hope for errors in the genes of SARS-CoV-2, um, which would help us in this pandemic. Yeah, one can certainly hope. Um, and, you know, what, what does a virus do? It invades host cells, replicates, comes out, and goes to another host. Now, selective pressure, which allows this, the propagation of this, typically, one would think, would be that you lower the virulence so that you cause less damage, and you increase the infectivity so that you can propagate more. Now, that's another way of calling this as a common cold. So common colds do that. You know, they don't cause too much damage, but they go around quite a bit, and, you know, these are rhinoviruses, uh, and some of them can be coronaviruses too. So you can have situations where mutations make the virus less infective. Uh, you can have others which actually make it open or, or more uh, virulent or less virulent. And you can have situations where they cause greater damage but still propagate. But these are all you know, lottery tickets, and we don't know which way they will go. Um, so typically, left to itself, a virus will infect large parts of the population and stabilize in a manner where it survives and allows the population to survive. 
Professor Sharma? Yeah. Uh, th th this is such an exciting area and a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much, Vijay. Uh, okay. I have two quick questions. The first one is, I was just wondering whether the, the, the term nervous system came first or the, the condition of being nervous and how they got <laughs> related to each other. Because I would imagine that nervous system controls not only the condition of being nervous, but also its opposite. So how did they get actually associated with each other? I'm not expecting yeah, you know, a clear answer, but maybe some idea. You know, the, um, there are, there's actually a, a beautiful book, which I'll hold up the moment if you give me a second. Mm. Uh, I would urge you all to Take a look at this book. This is uh, called The Idea of the Brain, A History by Matthew Cobb. It was brought out very recently. And Matthew Cobb is interesting because he's also brought out an earlier book on the history of molecular biology. He's a, incidentally a fruit fly biologist, but he also writes wonderful books. So here he points out, he answers the questions which you bring up about where, how did it, we come to understand the, the you know difference between um, the brain and other organs. How did we think emotion and feelings are in the brain? Earlier, it was thought to be in the heart, right? And the brain was just thought to be some kind of a cooling device, an air conditioning device for the rest of the organism. So how the brain came about to be the seat of the mind, as it were, is one issue. The other end of the spectrum are people like, you know, Luigi Galvani and others who looked at movements of legs of frogs, looked at you know, electric current in the nervous system and looked at it from a very you know, uninteresting as it were perspective, not about thought and consciousness, but about simple stimulation of movement. They identified nerves as you know, tubes which involved in movement. And it took a long time to connect that with what's happening in the brain. Yeah, so I mean, the, the quick point was, why is it, it would be called nervous system rather than confidence system, for example? So ah, the word okay. nervous, okay. Okay. you see yeah. why they, they get associated with being nervous, you know, the nervous okay. system. And right. so which one actually came first, the concept of nervous system or being so, nervous? First, no, so the, I think what came first is the definition of the nerve as, as the bundle of uh, cells which are present in the brain and which involve mo movement. So the, that the brain is uh, composed and the spinal cord is composed of nerves came first. And that whole thing was called the nervous system. And then being nervous is a consequence of the nerves being in the head. Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay, very, very good. Second part uh, was, uh, you see, one key aspect of movement, uh, let's say from insects uh, to house lizards, is related to the, the structures that they would have on their pods, the sticking micro nanostructures, which are smart uh, because the nerves would be, I mean, uh, be able to have some sensing mechanism uh, depending on where they want to stick uh, on a wet surface, on a dry surface, on a rough surface. And while sticking, they also have to move on demand. Uh, so a whole lot of, I'm just looking at the physical aspect of controlling adhesion uh, and, and peeling and uh, friction and movement. Now, uh, so this clearly would be related to certain kind of structures, but also the control, controlling the stiffness uh, and the direction, the angle of those structures, right? So now what kind of feedback mechanisms have anybody been looking at this aspect? Uh, certainly signals go through nerves and stuff, uh, but you know, how does uh, one manipulate uh, your adhesion and friction uh, based on, you know, sensing of the environment uh, continuously uh, and, and the role of those structures and movement. Uh, I, I don't know, that, I, from developmental biology, is there a link which is being investigated uh, to this? Yeah, yeah, this is a huge area of research. I didn't have time to touch upon that at all, but feedback from the external world in multiple ways is absolutely critical. 
And the way it takes place is the following. Whether it is stickiness of pause, or if you close your eyes, you still know that your arm is there, right? That's called proprioceptive feedback. When you close your eyes and lift your arm, you know how much you've lifted. So there are all sorts of sensors of various kinds, touch, pressure sensors, tension sensors, uh, sensors of you know, damage, uh, and so on and so forth. So all those sensors connect to the nervous system and feed back into the central nervous system. That's processed from the eye, from the specific kinds of limbs, and then uh, comes back into output. That part about how multimodal information is instantly processed and a decision made is something which is only now being understood. The brain, and including the spinal cord, is essentially an inference engine. It looks at these multiple sensors. It doesn't calmly calculate and say, here are A, B, C, D inputs, and this is what I need to do. From past experience, it just takes a leap of faith. You know, a zebra, when it sees spots, it doesn't investigate, could this be a cheetah or could it be a bed sheet? Let me check what, what is this. It just bolts instantly, right? Uh, and then, depending on how many times it's right or wrong, it corrects. So multimodal sensory information processing is a very exciting field. And from all these kinds of inputs, different organisms, people are studying this. And there's really, it's really wonderful to see how computational neuroscience is coming into uh, this kind of an area. It's a very hot topic. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I don't see any further questions. So uh, thank you, Professor Vijay Raghavan. It was a wonderful lecture and very um, on a very interesting topic. I now hand over the proceedings to Rajendra Pandey. Uh, thank you, Anupama, and thank you, Professor Vijay Raghavan, for a very exciting talk. And now we are close to the end of the program. I take this opportunity to thank Professor Ashutosh Sharma, Secretary, Department of Science and Technology, for releasing the IA50 logo. Thank you very much, Professor Avinash Pandey, Chairman, Governing Council, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, for releasing the e-magazine Dooth. We return our thanks to Professor Vijay Raghavan again, uh, Principal Scientific Advisor, Government of India, for delivering the Founders' Day lecture. A thoroughly enjoyable talk. My heartfelt thanks to the dignitaries and the participants for joining the event. We have about 150 participants at present. And last but not least, I thank the director, the dean, the colloquium committee, and of course, my team, for all their support. And uh, for your information, the, the e-magazine Dooth is available on our webpage. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all.